such wonderful it is for us to be here this morning. I want to say something right up front. If I had given Nathan the, the slide presentation, he did about half my talk this morning. And him talking about this song. This song is the thing we're going to talk about this morning. When Ian does our uh, music school in the summertime, he always picks two or three songs. And I know that he picks them for the words. Now, they're good songs, and they have nice melody. But if they don't have good words, it doesn't, it's not worth us singing. So, Lord willing, for the next two or three months that I speak, I'm going to talk about these songs and the words within them so that we can get a deeper meaning in the, in the words and thereby know more about the song and feel more about when we sing that we know what we're talking about. This song certainly is about being thankful and rejoice. As Nathan said this morning, we are so blessed. There is so much that God has given us that the idea of not being happy is hard to understand. We need to be happy. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna. I know that we have sorrows, we have conflicts, we have problems in this life. But from a spiritual standpoint, and from the standpoint that we can rely on our God and His Son, how can we not be happy about it? How can I keep from singing his, your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart to sing. God is our protector. He was the protector of the children of Israel of old, and he is our protector through his son. The psalmist said in 100 Psalm verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Even into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. This psalm was written some 3,000 years ago, maybe a little longer than that. But it holds true today. It holds true that because he endures, his truth, God, our God, lives forever, and his, he endures through all generations. And we need to be happy that we are his people. And we are the sheep of his pasture. Because who else could you more than want to have God and his son be our shepherd and take care of us? You remember way back when Moses began to lead the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt. They'd been there for a long time and they really didn't know who God was, it looks like. And God had these plagues that he sent on the Egyptians and that showed also the Israelite people who God was and that he was powerful. And here we find an example when they got ready to leave and they were leaving and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire. I'm sorry. Let me read this again. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people. Their animals, their carts, everything they could carry with them, and they were protected by God. He showed the way. Even at night, he was showing them where to go. That had to be an awesome sight to see a cloud that led them and a fire at night that kept everything lit up so they could move on if necessary. We find in Exodus, the 14th chapter, where the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp by Pahariv, Pahariv, between Milgdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before 
in it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, they're confused. And the wilderness has closed them in. He told Moses, he says, Moses, I want you to go towards the, the sea. And as you go towards the sea, you're going to get in, bottled in. Here is Egypt over here. They were moving east. And the historians are pretty sure that this is the place where God sent them. It was surrounded by the ocean or the sea here. And the Egyptian army on this side with no place to go. Now we know the account. We know how that God parted the, the Red Sea. And the children of Israel walked across on dry ground. Now, if you look at this picture, one of the things that got my attention was the scale of seven miles. So from here to the other side, to the Saudi Arabia side, is probably eight miles. It's not just a little bit of water. And the water was split, and the, and the children of Israel walked across it. Now, all that many people and their children and their animals and so on, they were probably lucky to make two miles an hour. So it took three and a half, four hours to walk across the Red Sea. And on top of that, the people that started at the end, surely it took them 30 minutes to an hour before they even got out there. So let's call it five hours. Not that it's super important, but it took a while. And they got out on the other side, and the Egyptian army, army as we know, saw that, and they began to chase them. Now, we don't know how far they got, but if they made it halfway out there when God let the waters come back together, they were three or four miles from the, from, the, uh, from the shore. It wiped them out. A power of God was showing the children of Israel what he could do for them. Well, okay. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider, he has thrown them into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He will become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. At that time, the children of Israel accepted God completely. They had seen these wonderful miracles that he had done, and they saw how they destroyed Pharaoh's army, and they were rejoicing. How long did it last? It wasn't very far from this period of time, a matter of days, that they were building a golden calf to worship. We have to be careful that we think about the things that God does for us and we need to remember them all the time. Because he does stuff for us every day. And he has promised stuff for us that was not even promised to the children of Israel. The song goes on to say, I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives. And I'll walk with you knowing you'll see me through. One of the promises that we have that the children of Israel did not have is we have the Savior. We have Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he said in Matthew 11 and 28, Come ye, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Did he say that we wouldn't have tribulation and trouble and sorrow? No. But what he said was, is I'm there. And if you'll give me your burden, I will take care of it for you. The blessing that we have in the Son of God. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Our God and his Son, cares for those that believe in his son and do his son's will. How great is that? In the 10th verse it says, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make, your perfect, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The God of all grace, the grace he gives to mankind, the forgiveness of sins through his son. It will make us perfect or complete. Will establish us, will hold us strong. 
strengthen us and settle you so that no matter what happens in this world, we have the promise that Christ is with us. We have the promise that we can overcome through him. Without God, there really really is no true happiness. People try to find happiness in wealth and in fame, but in the end, are they happy? Happiness comes from trusting God and having him on your side. That old bumper sticker I hadn't seen in a while, but it says, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. There's a corollary to that, which says, no God, no happiness. No God, no happiness. The idea that we can trust in the creator of this universe to protect us and to be with us and to be concerned with us can give us happiness. Look what Jeremiah said in the 8th chapter in the 18th verse. He said, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. He said, I tried to comfort myself because I was sad. It didn't work. I tried to do it myself. A little later on down there in the 20th verse, it says the harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. The children of Israel were in destitute. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black or sorrowing. Astonishment hath given, taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no fish, physician there? Gilead was the promised land, the mountains that in that area. He said, isn't there a God? Where is God? Is there no physician there? The children of Israel had left God. They didn't have God. They weren't happy. In Psalms 137, the writer there accounts the time that the children of Israel were taken into captivity to Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The children of Israel, and they probably didn't think this through very well, but they felt like that if they were not in the promised land and they were not at the temple, then they didn't have God. It was a physical religion, one of do's and don't commandments, one of great sacrifices of animals, and a place where they worshipped, which was at the temple. And these people were taken into captivity. And as far as those in captivity was concerned, They had no God. How can we sing of the Lord in a strange land? You and I have much better blessings than that. You remember the account in John, the fourth chapter, where Jesus and the Samaritan woman met at the well? In the 19th verse, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She said, you know, if you don't worship in a particular location, it was a physical thing. The temple in Jerusalem or on the high mountain, where do you worship? What was Jesus' answer? Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, and yet shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. What a greater blessing we have. We don't need a cathedral to worship God. We don't need this church building to worship God. When we leave and we go in the car and we go somewhere, we can worship God. Why? Because we worship him in spirit. He is within our heart. He is with us all the time. Unlike what the children of Israel thought as they had to be in Jerusalem or the Samaritans thought they had to be on the mountain. What a great blessing it is that we can call upon our God regardless of where we are. 
The Old Testament, the scriptures tell us, was but a shadow of things to come. That better things would be in our time, and they are. Remember of the men of old that's talked in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, but God had provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. What promise did God give us? His Son. Perfect redemption. The idea of having our sins removed through His sacrifice. These men, faithful and true, didn't have that. They searched, but didn't find it. On down in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruits of our lips, giving thanks to his name. What has God promised us? He has not promised us the promised land, the land where the children of Israel went. No, he has promised us a home in heaven, eternal life. How much more better is that? How much greater is that that God has given us that live in this dispensation of time? On top of that, we read in Romans, the 15th chapter, Now I say that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. You and I are not Jews of the ancient chosen people of God. But instead, we are God's chosen people as Gentiles. We had, the scriptures tell us, we had no God. We were strangers. And now we are a part. We are children of his. What kind of blessing is that? As Gentiles, we had no right to approach the Father. And now we do. What promise that is. One of the songs... Probably one of my favorite ones in the book is We Shall Assemble. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Sometimes, I think in my own mind, I have been a Christian a long time, most of my life, and I start taking things for granted. And I start thinking of all the problems I've got and all the things that I need to do. And things just aren't working out the way I want to. But why can't I remember all the blessings he's given us? Why can't I remember that I'm redeemed? I've been bought. The price was great. I've been gathered up. I've been taken care of. We don't want to take those things for granted. And that's what that song teaches us and tells us that we need to remember. Rejoice because salvation is ours. No matter what our stake is in life, no matter how many problems that we have in life, we can center in and we can look forward and understand that if we follow his son, we have salvation. 1 Peter 1, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while it need be you have need grieved by various trials, been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being made more precious than gold than that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with the joy inexpressible and full of glory to the receiving of the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. There is no greater blessing that God can give mankind to say, come and live with me for eternity. So the end of our faith is the salvation of our souls. Lonnie read this morning for me, thank you, from Psalms 126. It says here, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, 
we were like them that dream. The children of Israel had been in exile for some 70 years. And when they were coming back to Jerusalem, you know, remember we talked about how that they thought that they had to be in Jerusalem to be with God. And here they are coming back, and the ones that were coming back, they said, it's like a dream. It's unreal. It can't be true. We've been trying for, been crying to the Lord and praying to the Lord for 70 years, and now it's happening. It was a dream. It was so great. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Wherefore, we are glad. When you think of the blessings that God has given to us, when you think of the last day, when you think when you're before the throne of God and our Savior says, well done. It's going to be a dream. It's going to be unreal. It's going to be beyond comprehension. The Lord has done great things for us. Whereas, we are, wherefore, we are glad. We need to be glad. How can I keep from singing his praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the king, and it makes my heart to sing. If you're not happy as a Christian, there's something wrong. You need to investigate your life and figure out what that is. Because there is no greater place to be than to be a child of God. There's no greater place to be than here with this group of people, children of his. There's no promise, no greater than eternal life that God has promised us. If you're not a child of God, if you have not obeyed the gospel, if you don't believe, if you have not confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior and be, have your sins washed away from you, you don't get to experience this. This song is not your song. It's for the song of the people who believe. If you're subject to the gospel call, we ask you to come as we stand and sing two verses of the song selected.